videos of that. These are three established China scholars. The title, they both were, uh, all three work on, on the, on the political economy of China, the relation politics and economy. Mm. The title of the article was a surprise for many for party state capitalism in China. Not state capitalism, party state capitalism. Mm. Um, do you have two minutes? Summarize? Yes, yes, please. Now, the reason this is important is that in your analysis, Kishore, the internal, internal political arrangements in China, I don't think feature enough. They argue that the earlier concept before rise of Xi Jinping was mm. China developing state capitalism. Mm. But now, since the rise of Xi Jinping, 1.88 million non-state firms, private firms, 73% had established party cells by 2018. Cells. Members of the Communist Party have also been put on the board of almost every, and not have, almost every is important, not every, um, private company in China. Which therefore leads to very serious issues when you deal with China's so-called private economy. Because it becomes not just mm. state capitalism, it becomes party state capitalism. There are communist mm. party cells, and this is Megret Myers, great mm. Harvard Business School data. Mm. 73% of all private firms have communist party cells. Mm. And this is not true before mm. the rise of the Indian. Private businessmen who were allowed to enter Communist Party in 2000 or 2001. Mm. Communist Party members were not sent to, mm. to the boards or party cells were not created. Which essentially means that the private economy of China mm. is no longer private. And it's worse than state capitalism because Communist Party is firmly entrenched in the private economy. Means who controls TikTok's data, mm. who controls the data of various technology firms, mm. and how much Chinese state would cut the uh, clip the wings of, mm. of the Hanjiao companies, Hanjiao companies, and mm. how much time the owner of the mm. company would spend in Japan and how much in China, all of that is a reflection that private capitalism in China. And Communist Party must dominate it, at least until so far as until until the time that Xi Jinping is there. That being so, the economic relationship that we're talking about as the foundation mm. of the rise and of the ongoing trade, mm. which would not be affected by mm. the ban on chips or the rising, not significantly say affected mm. by a ban on chips. The rising uh, mm. unity between the two parties on the hill mm. uh, against China. How would you assess the implication of all this mm. for the evolution of the economy and its trade? Okay, thank you very much. Please. <laughs> well, I mean, I I I would say, uh, Ashu, that I would take a bet with the three authors. <laughs> I will take a bet with the three authors, $1,000, put money on the table. If you say that the Chinese capitalist system is self-destructing, and they may be right in the analysis, China's economic growth should go down. I mean, if you put party cells into private companies that decide how much production that should be and the owners have no way to decide how much to produce and the party controls everything, capitalism dies in China, then China's economic growth rate should be minus or 1% or whatever it is, right? If these people are right. But if I'm right, China will grow 4 to 5% next 10 years. Because the party has always been part of China. 
Deng Xiaoping, why did the crackdown in Tiananmen happen? Because Deng Xiaoping saw it, the great economic reformer, as a major challenge to the party. He says, no, the party must remain in power. So the, the, the emphasis on keeping the party in power, it's a rock solid consensus. How they translate it on the ground, if the Communist Party is very heavy handed, as, as the three authors say it is going to be, then the Chinese growth story is over. I agree with them completely. But I believe that the Chinese have ways and means of managing these things because they don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg, right? And if the, if the golden eggs continue in the next 10 years, and that's my prediction, then I would say they should go back and understand China differently. Because the way China governs itself is a way that the Chinese have worked out. It won't, it won't work in India, obviously, right? But the, 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 the consensus within the Chinese body politic on how you run society, how you manage society, even uh, as you know, a Harvard Kennedy School study showed that support for the Chinese Communist Party among the population of China uh, has gone up from uh, 86% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. There's a Harvard Kennedy School study that shows this. So when you see the Communist Party as being something that is foreign, that is so ruthless and different from the rest of China, actually, uh, the Chinese Communist Party at the end of the day has in a close to 100 million members out of 1.4 billion. And when I, when I had a research assistant in Columbia University, uh, a, a young lady from China, and she obviously one of the best and brightest to become, to get a master's scholarship in Columbia University. I sat down one day, had coffee with her, and I said, uh, uh, how was your life? And she said, I had a good life. And she, she says, when I graduated from high school, I was very depressed. So I said, why were you depressed? She said, I was the number two girl in this high school in the final exams. I said, hey, number two is very good. You know, I, I would accept number two. I'm happy. She said, no. I was very unhappy because only the number one is selected to join the Chinese Communist Party. So the, it's, it's, it is embedded in Chinese society in a way that you and I will not be comfortable with, but that clearly the Chinese people are comfortable with it. So when you see this uh, Communist Party of China as a great white shark that is going to come and eat up the Chinese economy, fine, let's see where that happens. But I put $1,000 on the table to say it won't. <laughs>